Hello and welcome to another installment of The Weird Chronicles. Each episode, we bring you tales of action and adventure from Malifaux and the other side. The Ringside is one of Malifaux's most infamous dens of violence and gambling. The gladiators and monsters that fight in the ring are little more than prisoners. But as today's story shows, the fighters sometimes fight back against their captors. I hope you enjoy Broken Creatures. Broken Creatures by Mac Martin She woke as she did most mornings, in tears. Her hands would shake as she clutched the glass bottle of bromo seltzer as she took a slow sip. Then she would look at her fingers for a while, studying the map of cuts from when she struck the mirror. With a deep breath, she would stand and take the long walk from her bed to the vanity on the other side of the room. Once there, she brushed the few tufts of hair that defiantly burst from her ruined scalp. This was always the hardest part. She missed her curling blonde waves. She remembered how she used to primp for summer dances back in Kansas. She donned her wig, a dark brown construction of horse hair and canvas. It looked passable in just the right light. Then came the eye patch. She had been offered a glass eye, but the rounded black leather of the patch helped to hide where the black blood had bubbled her flesh to the bone. She took deep breaths and choked down her sobs. The woman in the mirror wasn't a disfigured mockery of beauty any longer. She was just another damaged woman. She methodically powdered her cheeks and forehead, careful not to waste any of her dwindling supply. The world could stomach to see her now. Her name was Imogen Wyatt, and this is the story of how she learned to love herself again, through the eyes of a monster. Anyone in Malifaux the night the pits went up in flames heard plenty of tall tales. Some say it was the gladiator called Bishop that stoked the fires, and some say it was the beast Barbaros. But few know of Miss Wyatt, and none suspect her role in the night's affairs. Imogen worked the bone saw with all her strength as Calder bit down hard on the hilt of his whip. He screamed as best as he could with his mouthful as she moved the saw through his bone and then into the meat on the other side. Thank you, Mom, he sputtered in his delirium before passing out. She shook his stump by the tourniquet until he awoke. Iron. She nodded to the small brazier of red coals that provided both light and heat. His eyes widened, and he began to shake his head in a pleading motion. Iron, now, she repeated more firmly. He took the cool end of the long stick, lifting the branding iron unsteadily. She snatched it from his hands and, without warning, applied it to his stump. He screamed and lost consciousness once again. She peeled the iron away from his flesh and scraped the burnt meat off on the bedpost. She nodded at her patient and placed two pills and a glass of water on the small table by the bed. He'd need it if he ever woke up. Delicate hands as always. She recognised the voice of Wallace, one of the ringside's bookies and, if truth be told, jailers. She wasn't quite sure if he was being sarcastic or not. He was a good odds man, able to size up a potential fighter like others could value a dog or horse. He was grossly overweight, even at his near seven feet of height. And he was often covered in a thin sheen of sweat from the exertion of walking up and down the stairs and stuffy hallways of the ringside's catacombs. He gave a grin that, had he possessed all of his visible teeth, might be considered debonair. That settled it for Imogen. He was being sincere flirtatious even. In her past life, a man like this would never have dared speak to her, but now he would shun her if he knew the truth. She hated him for being both above and beneath her, a combination of scorn for the lower class and hatred for her betters. What else do those hands do expertly? He gave her a wink and leaned against the doorway, 
filling it with an outstretched leg and his arm. She wiped the blood off her saw with an old grey rag. Is there something you need, Wallace? She never engaged. She never returned his advances. That would be improper, and she knew that Wallace was not the sort of man she wanted to give any opportunity. Boss has a job for you down in the cells. His flirtation vanished in those words. Despite his lascivious manner, or perhaps because of it, he liked sending Imogen down there where she would be away from the bulk of the pit staff. She didn't mind, however. She opened the clasp on her doctor's bag and put her tools away. It wasn't a proper doctor's bag. She had fashioned it from tacks and faded yellow carpet, but it held the few medical instruments she had scrounged without too much fuss. You think Calder will wake up? Wallace moved into the room to inspect the man from the other side of the bed. It wouldn't be proper. She stopped herself and gave it real consideration. That creature nearly took his leg off. He gushed enough. If he is breathing in the morning, then maybe he will pull through. Speaking of, that's the job. Boss wants you to clip its wings. You think you can do that? He can't put it fighting in the pits if it can fly up and attack the audience. I... I don't think I can do that. Imogen fought back the wave of utter terror. It was bad enough that one of those things was in a cell beneath her, but going near it was more than she could handle. What if its blood got on her? Could things be even worse? There had to be an excuse the boss would accept, some reason to not go near the thing. When the trappers had brought it in last year, it had apparently looked like a child. She was still working in the morgue back then, but according to the jailers, it had grown quite a bit, and all at once. Tell the boss that it will just grow new wings, like when it grew last time. No, oh, he thought of that. Wallace slid a silvery blade from a sheath at his hip. It had strange runes carved into the metal, and a small soul stone glimmered in the hilt. He thinks this will cut him good. They took it off an Ortega a couple of nights ago. Wasn't cheap, neither. Imogen took the blade by the handle and turned it over. It wasn't as sharp as she would like, but it would certainly cut flesh. She didn't know much about magic, other than what she had seen in the morgue during her time before her stint in Smedley's. She couldn't think of a good reason not to try the blade. I'll need a butcher's apron, waders, and some of those long, thick leather gloves the bayou men wear. Before I go into the room, the beast had better be tied and gagged. There is nobody to cut on me if he decides to treat me like colder. It, not he. It. Wallace corrected her. Try not to think of it like it is a man. Reserve that for me. He leaned into the hall put his two fingers in his mouth and gave a loud, sharp whistle. He shouted down to someone. Have it shackled to the floor and get me some bayou gear. He waved his hand to Imogen, and she followed him, blade in one hand and bag in the other. The catacombs were a maze of rooms that had been sealed off from the sewer and repurposed by the owner of Ringside. While the damp hallways mostly served as support tunnels for the gladiatorial games upstairs, the two of them headed into the darker recesses, which had a darker function. Along the way, they were joined by four other men, one of whom carried the heavy leather protective gear, usually used by the men who headed into the bayou. A few sets of stairs and several winding halls later, the group stood outside a cell door, its iron bar door secured by a thick chain and lock. Imogen slipped into the leathers, breathing slowly to calm her nerves. As she did, Two of the men reached into the cell with long poled man catches, securing the spiked neck braces to the creature inside. She watched as they forced something to the ground, and then Wallace opened the door as little as he could, and while still squeezing his belly into the room. They passed the chains into him, and she could hear him securing the beast to the iron loops on the floor with ropey rattling sound. Wallace came out of the room, slapping his hands together and the other men removed their weapons from the cell. All yours? Thank you, Mr. Wallace. 
She tried to maintain her composure as best as possible, fighting hard not to turn and run down the hall. The cell was dark. Two hooded lanterns swayed a bit, providing a dull yellow and erratically moving light. She summoned all her strength and went to work. She knelt next to it and looked it in the eyes. It was defiant, but it was just like the one that took her beauty. It had the same grey-blue skin, the same horns and hooves. It was naked and chained to the cold stone floor, but it was no less the monster that made her. Her fear was battered away by an ocean of hate and rage. All that was taken from her, the version of herself that even now would be all the more glorious. She had grown up doted upon. McMorning would have made her a modern Helena. This thing took that from her. It dragged her into the depths with it. It cast her down into this pit. Now she could do little more than ensure that it would never soar. She could only take this small revenge. She turned the blade over in her hand, looking at how the runes glowed a deep red as it cut into the muscles in the creature's back. She wouldn't take the wings. She would leave them as a crippled reminder for the creature, if it could remember at all. The knife dug deep. Splatters of blood sizzled on her waders. The creature's screams were odd. She could have sworn they were her own. Bishop took a long look at Calder's new leg. The two had fought in the ring before, but Calder had been absent. Now Bishop knew why. The ringside's boss had secured the terror trot and put it through its paces. Bishop was supposed to fight it next, when Calder lost the leg. After that, he hadn't seen either of them for months. Now Calder took a defence stance before him, a contraption of clockwork and iron strapped to his right knee. Fight! The announcer bellowed into his bright yellow megaphone as he waved it across the crowd. The pits were sunk a good twenty feet into the ground, and each was at least thirty feet across. The throng of people above pressed towards the railing, screaming for blood and waving their yellow or blue betting stubs. Bishop began to circle left, watching Calder's leg for signs of weakness. Calder followed suit, lifting his leg up with each step. Just as Bishop thought, the leg worked fine for moving forwards and likely for turning, but sidesteps were beyond its clockwork articulation. If Bishop came at him from the side, perhaps he would have an opening. Realising his error in following Bishop's lead, Calder sprang into action. He placed his new foot on the wall behind him. With the telltale pneumatic hiss, his entire body launched forward like an arrow, hurtling into Bishop and the two of them smashed to the ground. Bishop planted his feet and rolled them both, landing on top of Calder in a straddle. Their eyes locked for a heartbeat. Bishop hefted his chain-wrapped fist into the air and brought it down with a wet crack on the centre of Calder's face. A fountain of red blood stained the dirt floor of the pit. Calder planted his own foot onto the floor and activated the pneumatic again, rocketing his leg up, using his hip as a pendulum anchor. The armor knee stuck Bishop in the back and flung him forward. Bishop hit the dirt a few feet away, but managed to roll his feet. The pneumatic was heavy, and it slowed Calder's ability to stand. As he brought himself to his feet, Bishop darted to the left and rushed in. Calder kicked like a mule, but Bishop blocked it with his right arm. There was a snap as Bishop's bones gave way. But it was too little, too late. The chains around Bishop's left hand had unspooled and wrapped around Calder's neck. Bishop planted a foot on Calder's chest and fell backwards, pulling the man's throat forward with a crack. With his forearm twisted back towards his elbow, Bishop stood slowly to the thunder of the crowd above. The ring guards rushed forward with their man-catchers and forced him back to his knees. A rain of the worthless yellow betting stubs floated down into the pit. The boss needs to know when he can fight again. Wallace chewed on a strip of gator jerky as he spoke, a bottle of faintly green ale with the label peeled away in his offhand. 
He was still dressed in his ringside armour, a brushed steel breastplate and armoured sleeve. Too early to say. Imogen's voice was soft, so that it didn't affect her hands. Bishop was clamped into one of the inspection chairs, thick chains holding his throat, legs and left arm to the table. His right arm, while free, was nearly useless. Waggle your fingers. Bishop opened and closed his fist with a grimace. It looks like his hand will be fine. It is likely a clean break. He'll need a splint and a few months to heal. Even then, his arm will be weak. If you want him prime, you're going to lose at least half a year. The boss ain't going to like that answer. Wallace spoke without swallowing, spraying the floor with bits of jerky. He doesn't pay me for lies, Wallace. Maybe get one of those healers out of the kingdoms. I hear the monks can tend to anything. Imogen gave Bishop a cold look, her eyes locking his. This will hurt. I'm going to straighten the bone on the count of three. One. Two. Bishop grunted as she pulled the arm straight on the early count. It was the first time a patient hadn't screamed. She then began splinting his arm between two old and knotted boards. Boss says he can heal in the cells. You can check on him there. Wallace tossed a small ring of keys into Imogen's dull yellow carpet bag. Don't give him too many painkillers. We're going to need him angry as a gator in a mine. Wallace snapped his fingers with enough force to make the fat on his arm waggle. The guards came in response to the noise and took Bishop away in chains and man catches. Imogen packed her bag and followed the men. They walked the narrow corridors into the catacombs. As they passed one of the recuperation rooms, Imogen directed two of the men to bring a mattress. Good rest will get him on his feet faster, she told Wallace when he gave a disproving look. Once chained into the cell, Bishop sat silently on the mattress and squinted into the light in the hallway. The guards had kept his chain short, and they had bound his left wrist to his throat, leaving his right arm free to heal. He had a few feet of movement, enough to get a little exercise, but not enough to move about his cell with ease. Imogen found a small wooden stool and set it near the cell. I'm going to monitor him a while. I don't want that arm going green on us. Wallace nodded his approval and stared down at her a little too long for comfort before he decided to waddle off. He stopped a few steps away. I'll have the kitchen bring you something when we feed the freak. Don't get too close to his cell. He slips his chains from time to time, and I'd hate if he did anything to a lovely lady like you. He jerked his thumb towards the cell across the hall. He grinned now, showing his missing teeth. That's where we put the Nephilim, by the by. He chuckled to himself as he left down the corridor. Imogen sat quietly for a few minutes and looked at the chains on the beast's door. She liked it down in the catacombs, despite the proximity to the creature. There was a sense of purpose. The dim light hid her scars, and the cool air felt pleasant. She thought about a lot of things while sitting there. She thought about the beast in the cell just a few long steps away. How she'd hurt him, and how he deserved it. She thought about how Wallace was more manageable after she'd done that. After he had seen what she would do. Wallace had seen the monster she was, without having seen her ruined flesh. She thought about that for a long time too, how she'd lost a piece of herself. She was startled then when the guard came with three stacked trays of food. For her, there was a hunk of hardened cheese, some soft bread and a small cup of beans on a plate. To the side was a rapidly cooling cup of tea, a glass of water and several slices of apple. The last were a rare delicacy in Malifaux especially considering how free of decay they were. Below that tray was another one, stocked a bit bearer. It contained a small pile of bacon, some of yesterday's bread, and another bowl of beans. This one was wider, and the entire affair lacked any utensils. The dishes were thin clay, hard to hurt someone with. She suspected that this was for when Bishop woke up. Her suspicions were proven correct when the guard shone a light into the cell, and once seeing Bishop still chained up, he went in and placed the food just within reach. The last tray didn't shock Imogen as much as she thought it should. It was a foot, 
from about halfway up the car down to its two missing toes. The guard took it off the tray and threw it into the creature's cell. Imogen immediately heard it growl and noisily feast. The guard dismissed himself with a tip of his wear-worn hat and a soft mom before leaving. Imogen was about to return to her thoughts, or maybe the yellow-paged novella she had tucked into her bag, when Bishop spoke. Think I'll lose the arm. It wasn't what she expected. Most men, when faced with losing a limb, were scared or brave. Either way, they were dealing with a dreadful possibility, and that meant coping with fear. He was simply curious, like he wanted to place a bet, like he was sizing up the situation. I don't know. If the green doesn't set in, you'll keep it. If it heals right, you'll keep most of your strength. It was only a little bit of a lie. Most broken bones set in an odd way, and the muscles around them never fully recovered. With a break that bad, he'd feel it almost every time the weather changed. The light from the lanterns in the hall only illuminated part of his cell. She could see his shadow moving around a bit, and then he came into the bright area to pick up his food. He had trouble dipping the bread into the beans, but he managed. Gonna be rough not going crazy here. Gonna need to know the day and the time. I'll be checking on you regularly. He was more resigned to his time in the pits than she expected. He was focused on his survival, not his rage. She knew that all too well. You seem to be very accepting of your fate. The voice behind her was guttural and unpracticed. Slave dreams of sky. It made her start for the second time in an hour, her heart beating in her chest so loudly that she thought she might faint. She turned and saw it there, pressed against the bars of its cell. Slave dreams of broken chains. It can speak. Imogen was asking more of the universe than of Bishop. He answered nonetheless. They all can. I usually just do it to spook you. Well, it's working. Can he understand me? She spoke about the beast as if he wasn't there, but her pulse was intimately aware of its presence. Barbarous knows words. Barbarous knows cutter. He flexed the muscles in his back, causing the glimpse of visible wing to jiggle a bit, and he snarled. The tendon she had severed would never heal and his wings were limp and useless now. Good. Then you know that you deserved it. Imogen was growing accustomed to being angry when she should be afraid. Barbarous nose. Barbarous smiles for Cutter. Cutter rages like flowers. The sharp features of his face twisted up in what might be considered a smile, brandishing his yellow teeth. I don't know what you're babbling about. Silence yourself. She reached into the bag and pulled out the knife she'd used to maim him. The Nephilim showed no fear, but he did as she ordered, withdrawing into his cell. I reckon he likes you. Bishop wasn't making a joke. Again, he was considering the situation. You can't reason with him, you know. The Nephilim, I mean. They don't think like we do. Hold your arm out into the light. It was clear that she was done talking about it. Bishop did as he was told. You're clear for now. I'll check back on you tomorrow. Imogen had been true to her word. Every morning she began by checking on Bishop's arm. He tried to keep a schedule for himself and he marked it by her appearance. He alternated the days, exercising for an hour one day and three the next. He flexed the hand of his broken arm nearly constantly, biting through the pain when it got unbearable. Imogen monitored his arm while aiding it with an expensive salve over the course of the two months, after which time it was out of the splint. He would be fighting again soon. Wallace often checked on his progress for the boss, and Imogen spent more and more of her time down in the catacombs, It was dangerous for her there, not because of Barbarous or Bishop, but because of Wallace. The halls beneath the ringside weren't well-travelled, and the lascivious brute often took pleasure by leering at Imogen. 
it was becoming apparent that Wallace was growing bolder, despite her display of violence against the Nephilim. He was growing crasser in her presence, commenting often on her appearance. Eventually, threats of the boss's displeasure wouldn't serve to keep him at bay. In his mind, he was entitled to her. She did her best to ignore it as she went about her daily rounds, avoiding him where she could and leaving as quickly as possible when she couldn't. She even contemplated letting him see her without the wig, but that was a dangerous gambit in its own right. Today, however, was especially troubling. When she arrived, he greeted her with a wink and a lick of his lips. Everywhere she went, he was somewhere to be seen. Imogen could only put off going down to the cells for so long. She prepared herself mentally for the worst. Today could be the day. She made sure that her bag was always within reach, and she propped several scalpels in her book so that handles pointed up and were easy to reach. How's my favourite nimble-fingered strumpet? Wallace rapped on the doorframe with a hairy knuckle as he entered the storeroom. Imogen filled her carpet bag with a fresh roll of gauze and several brown cork-stoppered bottles of liquid. What do you need, Wallace? She tried to keep her voice flat, all business. Wallace laughed to himself. Well, where should I start? He put his arm against the wall and leaned, taking some of his weight off his feet. A pair of guards appeared at the door. Wallace, the boss needs to know about the new crop of dentured. The big sweaty man kept his eyes on Imogen. And I need to check on the cells. She ducked out of the room, thankful for the escape. She walked quickly, working hard to not break into a run. She was acutely aware that she had shown Wallace fear. That gave him power, and he was the type of man to seize power. She took a roundabout path to the catacombs in an effort to shake any possible pursuit. Hopefully he would give up on following her for the day. It wasn't likely. During her routine, Imogen would often interrupt Bishop exercising in whichever ways he could while chained in the cell. Today, however, she caught him speaking to Barbaros. They spoke openly through the bars to their cell, as no guards were posted in this tunnel. They apparently hadn't heard her approach, so she began to walk softly. She approached a step at a time until she could make out their words. It was surprising to her that they talked at all, but what they talked about was even more perplexing. Barbaros had begun fighting in the arena again, and Bishop was apparently training him. He was describing the strongest fighters, not sure who Barbaros would face next, and he was telling him how to win. In return, Barbaros was keeping him appraised as best as the beast could, of the goings-on above. I hurt his left arm as asked. The monster's voice hadn't changed, but it had apparently developed its vocabulary considerably in the last few months. If you face him, he will have a weak grip on his sword without those fingers. I'll need it. My arm is still weak. Just keep hitting them on their left. I want as many fighters favouring that side as I can. You'll die if you fight. Your arm isn't healed. Imogen wasn't sure why she spoke. She didn't know why she even cared. This was just a job. He was just meat, like her. Well, don't just hide, Cutter. Come join us. Barbaros's invitation was coarse, but Bishop interjected before Imogen could respond. It isn't going to get better. I've started putting more weight on it. The bones hold in my body and the muscles work. It's not as strong as I like. But I'll be able to use it. No, you don't understand. Imogen didn't know what had come over her. They are billing your return this Saturday night. Everyone is betting on you. They can't let you win. Bishop didn't respond. She had come to know what he was thinking. Barbarous came to his cell door. He is dreaming of the sky cutter. The beast hadn't spoken to her since that first night, but now its speech had the same poetry to it. Don't call me that! Imogen barked at him, her fury rising. He thinks that you're beautiful. 
Bishop tried to smooth things over. Was she trapped between friends? Had Bishop allied himself with the beast? He doesn't know what's under all of this. She waved her hand in front of her wig and eye patch. But he does. Bishop spoke flatly, like a man explaining a plan of attack. He saw what's under the skin. And I know what's under the wig. He sees you clearly. Barbaros reached a hand through the bars to point at her, his sharp black nail directed at her chest, not her head. You are filled with hatred that is like a rose. Beautiful anger, a sunset of rage. You know what it is to lose something you cherished, to never become what you should have become. You did this to me. He waggled his wing at her. You made me like you. I see that beauty now. You don't know it. But you have given me a gift. Don't try to figure it out. He doesn't think like us. He holds different grudges. Bishop warned. Imogen stood quietly for a moment, her breathing ragged as if she'd been running, an excited sound out of place with her motionless body. In the laboratories and academic worlds, there is a phrase, the eureka moment. It is reserved for a breakthrough, a realisation that brings into perfect clarity a complex science. It is every great mind's hope to have that moment while sitting quietly at breakfast or waiting for a carriage to arrive. It's a single moment that changes everything that a person once believed to be true. Imogen had her moment. It did not come slowly over the course of months. It had built. It had broiled in the back of her mind. It had built pressure every morning when she wept into her mirror. She had not grown accustomed to her scars over time, but she accepted them now, in this moment. She was a monster. She did monstrous things. She cut wings, she severed legs, and she was filled with hate for the torture of the ringside. The moment came over her like an explosion of steam, frustration, and clarity. There was no plan. There was only purity of purpose. She was something new now. Someone else. She would never be the beautiful blonde goddess she was born to be. Her mother's training and father's doting would never create that perfect angel but she could still be a glorious devil. I'm going to do something, but you must promise me one thing. Imogen's voice was flat. What are you going to do? Bishop's tone matched her own. Promise me that you'll kill the boss. Promise me you'll track down every man who ever abused or took advantage of someone innocent. You'll send them to me here so that I can make them pay. Promise me that, and I'll do it. Bishop didn't take oaths lightly. I can't keep that promise in here. I know. Imogen clutched the handle of her bag tight enough to whiten her knuckles. You have my word. Imogen reached into her carpet bag and took out her keys. What's going on here? It was Wallace. She hadn't heard him walk up behind her. She was so distracted with her own thoughts. It was too late, though. He must have heard them talking. Imogen turned so that she could look at him. He carried a sharpened meat hook in his armoured hand, a man-catcher in the other, and that arrogant look on his face. She locked his eyes as she threw her keys into Bishop's cell. I'm murdering you. Wallace pushed her aside, slamming her into the heavy oak of Barbarus's door. Wallace dropped the man-catcher so that he could fumble at his belt for the keys. Don't you dare touch them, Bishop. You unlock those chains and we'll feed you to the Nephilim. Bishop was faster than the fat man. By the time Wallace had opened the cell, Bishop was ready to pounce. He slammed into the door, flinging it outward, and they both spilled into the corridor. The two men sprawled onto the rough stone, smearing it with blood from multiple scrapes. 
Despite his size, Wallace was impressively fast and managed to find his feet at the same time as Bishop. The two squared off at each other. Wallace wore his armour on his right arm, protecting him from Bishop's more powerful left. In his right hand, Bishop twirled the end of his chains, making a soft whipping sound. Wallace gripped the sharpened meat hook tight, like a tiny scythe, and clucked his tongue. You still lame and you knows it. Wallace came in low with the hook, looking to force Bishop back. The fat man's blow caught Bishop's arm, but it was protected by the wrapped chain. Wallace kept the flurry of blows coming, forcing Bishop to take measured steps backwards towards the end of the hall. Bishop let the man lead him. He knew that once his back was to the wall, he would have an advantage. He could brace himself, and the wide slashes couldn't overextend without hitting stone. A few steps at a time, they danced backwards. Imogen leapt, clinging to Wallace like a cloak. Wallace stumbled back a step or two, and Bishop lunged in to take advantage of the distraction. Bishop's chain wrapped around the taller man's arms, but Wallace had hiked on his side. He pulled Bishop an inch off the ground by the chain and smashed his forehead down on the bridge of dangling fighter's nose. Wallace grabbed Imogen by the wrist, pulling her off his back. Bishop slowly shook the haze out of his head as Wallace set the woman down on her feet in front of him. With Bishop still dangling by the wrist, the brute brought his hook across her mouth. She stumbled back, spinning with the force of the blow. Her wig flew further, tumbling to the ground. She fell to her hands and knees and looked up at Wallace. Her cheek had been cut deep, opening the flesh from the corner of her mouth up her jaw, her broken teeth showing through the gash. She spit out a few pearly white shards of her molar. Wallace gave her a stern look, shaking his head at what he'd just discovered. I'll finish uglying up that mouth to match your face when I'm done with him. Bishop kicked, but it made contact with Wallace's upper thigh and did little to injure him. The bigger man slammed Bishop into the wall several times, but the chain was wrapped tight. Wallace finally settled for a quick end to the fight. He spun Bishop around in the grapple and leaned himself into the wall, giving Bishop no perch to struggle from. Then he forced Bishop to his knees and then down to lay flat on his stomach. Wallace put his foot on Bishop's back and used his weight to hold the weakened gladiator down. Boss ain't gonna be happy that I cut your throat, is he? Wallace flipped the hook around in his free hand so that he could kneel down and slice Bishop's throat in one easy motion. With the sound of tearing meat and a gurgle of blood, Barbarous tore out the fat man's throat. Wallace turned as the blood ran down his chest. Imogen stood a few paces down the hall in front of the Nephilim's open cell, keys still in the door. She locked eyes with him again, the loose flesh on her cheek quivering as she spoke just loud enough for him to hear. I thought I was clear. I'm murdering you. Wallace clutched his throat, forcing the blood to seep through his fingers. He dropped his weapon and then fell to his knees. His lips were still sputtering, his lungs filling with blood, as Barbaros began stripping him of his armour. Bishop untangled the chain and stood, catching his breath. Is there a plan now? Barbaros wasn't really asking. He was reveling in the kill as he strapped the armour to his own arm. Imogen spoke flatly. Kill the boss. They all need to know that I'm in charge now. Imogen reached into her bag and began wrapping gauze around her cheek. She turned to Bishop. Then you'll be free. To keep your promise. Barbarous began to idly gnaw on the dead fat man's leg. Bishop picked up the hand scythe and wiped Imogen's blood off onto Wallace's shirt. You have my word. That's it for another instalment of The Weird Chronicles. Join us next time for more tales of action and adventure.